GDB PETA is great. We're going to be uh, using that throughout the whole process. Uh, I'll, you can download it right here at this link. Um, if you just Google GDB PETA, it's very easy to find. When you go to the GitHub, it's three lines to install it. The last line isn't even a real part of the install. It just echoes congratulations. S-Trace and L-Trace are great. We can use those to see, hey, you know, is my shell code running when I wanted it to run? Is this, how is this program running? They're great for reverse engineering. Uh, L-Trace occasionally, if a password is being passed in plain text using string compare or something, L-Trace will catch it. It'll say passwords do not match and give you the actual password. It's great. Read elf we're going to use to tell us if that dep is enabled, is the stack executable, is it not. Object dump gives us the full assembly of a program. I mean, it, object dump is amazing. It can be used for so many different things. Most of these are actually going to come with your Kali machine, like MSF Venom and MSF Elf Scan and object dump and read elf. You're going to have to install a GDB PETA, S trace, and L trace yourselves. Uh, MSF Venom uh, generates your shellcode, and MSF Elf Scan is nice for finding uh, jump and call points in your uh, executable Linux files. Pattern Offset and Pattern Locate we're going to create to get EIP control, and the rest is just for assembly and uh, script development. If you're uh, not very good at Python, I highly suggest you learn it. It's going to be very, very useful for these sorts of things. Okay, so let's get started. So if for those of you that downloaded the zip file, this is what you're going to see. It's going to have five different files. The test.c is just the basic code. We can go over that. Uh, actually, we'll go over that second. And uh, for those of you that haven't caught it yet, the chat actually has the, uh, the zip file. So the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to understand the behavior of the program. You have a binary here. You know, what can I do with it? How far can I go? How does this binary work? Those are all questions you need to ask yourself. And so the best way to understand how a binary works is, well, run it. So we're going to run it, dot slash test. And so we get a segmentation fault already, and we get a null value. But we haven't provided it any user input. Let's see if the segmentation fault actually gives us CIP control. Oh, sorry about that. Let me get GDB PETA back up and running. Great. So if you see GDB PETA, the difference will be this nice little red text versus that. And, and you'll notice a lot of differences. GDB won't output the full stack. GDB PETA will give you all sorts of information. It's actually made for exploit development. It just it makes things so much easier. So we'll set a breakpoint in the main function. Uh, actually, we don't even need to do that. We'll just run the program normally. We didn't give it any arguments before. We won't give it any arguments now. And so we see 6 seg v. That's uh, representative of our segmentation fault. That means the program didn't run su successfully. I'm sorry. But if we look at our EIP, we see a string copy call and all sorts of junk. We, we don't really have any user input to overflow with yet. So this segmentation fault isn't a buffer overflow at this point. It's just the program doesn't know how to interpret what it's been given. So as we see this null, let's try to provide an argument. So it's not asking for input on execution. It's probably asking for some arguments. So we'll do two ways. Cool. So now we have even more behavior. So we no longer get that segmentation fault. We know this is how the program was meant to be run. We know that this isn't a buffer overflow. It's able to accept all this, and there's no errors. It's not closing out. It looks like this program is fine. So what is it doing exactly? So we're seeing the output of the ID command. We can compare like this. We see, oh, it's exactly the same. So there's a really high probability that this program is probably calling the system ID command somehow. And then we see right here, it's just printing, let's try to get slash bin slash sh. So it's mocking us a little bit, but we'll get it, don't worry. And so it echoes two lines. It returns our value to us that we provide it. It does an ID, and then it echoes a second line. So let's see what this looks like in the actual C code. And let's see what makes this vulnerable. 
So here we're just including some libraries for those of you that haven't uh, played with C much. I added some comments to let you know how to compile these with and without protection. You'll notice that test.c was actually, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the regular test was compiled with no protections at all. Uh, we're going to be exploiting this one with only ASLR on. Test2 was compiled with dep, so it's going to have that stack execution prevention we talked about. And we're also going to do that one both with dep only and dep and ASLR. And by the time we're done, you'll know how to bypass two protections three different ways. So let's look at the rest of our C program. Here's our vulnerable function. We looked at this back in the PowerPoint. So again, we've allocated only 256 bytes available. And we're saying, OK, so take our argument then, stick it into this buffer, which has 256 bytes available. But don't check. Don't do any sanitation. We don't care. So we're really putting a lot of faith in the user on this one. When we tell them 256 bytes, we're hoping they stick to 256 bytes. This function is where it does the bulk of its work. Here is where we get our argument returned to us as a value. Here is where we call our vulnerable function with the argument that we provided. There's our nice ID call from the system. And a printf, which just says, let's try to get slash bin slash sh. A very basic C program. There's nothing too special about this, but it's very, very exploitable. So we have this code, we know how the program functions, and, and we get the gist of it. You know, you give it some stuff, and it echoes it back to you. I mean, it's nothing fancy, right? So how could we exploit this? So the first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take advantage of a technique called fuzzing. And what fuzzing does is it's just going to generate characters, one character, 100 characters. I mean, th there's all sorts of different kinds of fuzzing. You can fuzz for SQL injection. You can fuzz for directories. In this case, you're going to be fuzzing for a buffer overflow. And so instead of giving it all sorts of fancy characters, we're just going to give it different amounts of A's. And we're going to see, OK, if we give this a massive amount of A's, at some point, will this program crash? So 1A, 100 A's, 200 A's, so on and so forth. So if we look here, we'll notice our fuzzer.py. So let's take a look at how this works. So we're importing the subprocess library. Nothing special there. It's just going to uh, run system commands directly on Linux. We're setting some variables for incrementing. Uh, you know, this Y is what we're going to be incrementing to create more and more A's for the buffer. Uh, X is just going to keep track of how many times we've done this. So as long as X is less than 20, we're just going to keep appending to the Y and increasing its value and adding this to a list. That way we can have a list, a long list, 20 different strings, all of different lengths, and we're just going to send the smallest string and then increment it by 100 every time and see, OK, will this program crash? Is there a point where this program will crash? And so here we do for every single string in that list we've created, we're going to print the length of the string so that we know what size the string is that we're sending. And then we're going to try to run the string against the program. And this is where it's done, subprocess.checkoutput. It's just going to run the program in the system, and it's going to save everything to an output variable. And so if we look here, it's just running dot slash test with our buffer. And it's going to do this for every single buffer length in that checklist. And then here, all we do is we say, OK, when we've reached a segmentation fault, when there's been an error running this program, just exit. We don't want to fuzz it anymore. We already know that it's vulnerable. So now we're just going to run our fuzzer. And we're going to see, OK, is there a point in this program where we can get a nice segmentation fault? It looks like there is. After the length of the buffer reached 300 bytes, we got a segmentation fault output. So I just got a question. They're asking what slash x means. Uh, when you add a slash x like this and add a number after it, that means it's a hexadecimal. 
And so what do you do with hexadecimal? This is the format of the code in which we'll be, this is the format of the code we'll be passing as shell code. It's, it's a lower level code that the system understands and turns into assembly. And so uh, if we do pr uh, Python dash C print slash X for one, so slash X for one is very common. It's the most common one people use for buffer overflows. If we do an enter, you'll see why, because it simply translates to a capital A. So we're simply just passing hexadecimal and we're having the system convert it. And remember, this is lower level, which is what we want because our shell code needs to be assembly language so that when we insert it, the program goes through every single byte. So if we gave it shell code like X41, X41, once we reach the EIP and we do a jump to our ESP, it'll say X41 instruction. Okay, next instruction, X41 instruction. It's just the hexadecimal conversion. You'll notice that, in, uh, you may figure it out eventually, uh, that binary is just uh, on or off in the eight bits between the 32 bits. You, you'll see zero, one, two, four, and that converts to decimal. Those, the number that you create in the binary converts to a decimal. The decimal number will convert to a hexadecimal, and then this hexadecimal number can convert to ASCII. Um, some things won't make sense, like FF it just gives us a question mark. So FF could be an instruction in the assembly, for example. You know, it, not everything has an ASCII conversion, but hexadecimal can be anything from slash X00 to slash XFF. Okay, so uh, back to the segmentation fault. We notice that we have a buffer length of 300 bytes, and this is what segmentation faults are uh, programmed. So what we want to do is, well, let's start with an exploit skeleton. What we're going to have to do first is create another program that can simply recreate the segmentation fault. We don't want to do anything crazy, just let's make another segmentation fault. So we're going to cp fuzzer.py and we're going to make a skeleton.py. Now let's get rid of this, some of this junk. We don't need all this. Um, we don't need these variables for incrementing. We don't need a super long list anymore. We don't even need this for loop. And we're not going to do a try except because we already know this is going to crash our program. So this quickly became a much smaller script. All we're going to do here is we're going to make, we're going to change this to buffer, make things a bit more clear actually. Length of the buffer. Okay, great. So we wanted this to be 300 bytes, and we're all set. So this is going to take a variable, assign 300 A's to it. It's then going to print out the length of our buffer, I'm sorry, the length of our buffer, which should be 300. And then it's going to run this against the dot slash test program. So we can see here, we got a nice little segmentation fault. So before the reason we had that try accept was so that it would exit before it would give us all this skunk, but because the program couldn't exit properly, we get all this nice output. So let's add that try accept back. Just to clean up the output. Okay, cool. So our now skeleton has worked. It gives 300 bytes and it causes a segmentation fault. Well, let's change it up a bit further. I want to have a bit more control over how I'm going to be able to run this. We're simply going to print the buffer now. Okay, so now it just prints 300 days. So how we're going to take advantage of that is these nice little parentheses here. When you put that dollar sign in front, it means execute a bash command within the bash. So we're going to nest bash. So we're going to say run dot slash test. We know that this takes a command line argument, so we're going to pass it 300 days. And we can do that very easily like this. Oh, hold on.
there we go. So it gave us the value and it sec faulted. But now, of course, since we're going to create an exploit in the end, we're going to want to add this to our exploit skeleton. So our skeleton simply prints it out. We can now do test python skeleton.py. Same behavior, same output. We got what we wanted. So let's take this a step further. Now we're going to see how this affects the binary during runtime. Dash Q just means, uh, I'm sorry, dash Q just means quiet. You don't have to add it. It'll work just fine without the dash Q. If we do a run python skeleton.py from here, there we go. So if we look at this, we'll see 414141 stop sig seg v. I mean, this can be a lot of information if you've never seen this before, but let's break it down. So we supplied 300 A's. Of those 300, 200 got stored in the EAX. So it's safe to say 200 A's went all the way down and then reached a point where at some point it's overflowing the EIP. As you can see, four of our A's are there. And even the ESP and the EBP, the ECX, and the EDX. So we have control over a few different registers. The two that stand out to me the most are going to be the EAX and ESP. <clears throat> the great thing about those is that there's jump calls for them almost always. And so how are we going to find that jump call? It's quite easy. Oh, let's see, I have a question here. So the length was set to 256 bytes to accept. So we gave 300 in this example because if it was set to accept 256, 300 would overflow the EIP. So yeah, 257 might be an over buffer overflow, 258 bytes might even be a buffer overflow, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're overflowing anything that'll break the program yet. What's nice about 300 bytes is we've overwritten the CIP. And that's actually where a crash occurs in the buffer overflow. When you overwrite that EIP, the program says, okay, I don't know any point in memory where 41414141 exists. That's not an instruction for me. And so a segmentation fault and just crashes because it no longer knows where to go. So we did 300 because that was when we were able to get that EIP control and crash the program. So somewhere between 256 bytes and 300 bytes we can get full control and store some Bs in there. Great. And so if we look here, we notice here's all our A's. Everything is overflow, everything is overrun. So let's try to find some jump points. We have ESP, we have EAX. If we added more of a buffer, I'm sure we could overwrite ESP even more. But first, before we do any more overwriting, let's see, what can we do? So there's two great programs. There's, M well, so first we should get that EIP control, but keep in mind that those EAX and EI, uh, ESP are what we're going to use to exploit the binary. So first we know that 300 days overruns the EIP at what point do we get EIP control? We can use MSF pattern create. So you can do a locate on your system and you'll find an MSF module named pattern create. So let's create a pattern with a length 300 bytes. Great, so this is a 300 byte pattern. So then we're just going to run our program again, but we're gonna give it this argument now. And we still get a segmentation fault. We notice our pattern is all over the place in the program. And then we notice that this is now in our EIP. So if we scroll up a bit, EIP here is 41414141. If we recall from one of the questions earlier, we'll notice that slash x41 is an A. And what we provided were 300 A's. So 300 A's, four of them filled up in the EIP. Here, we have four other characters filling up our EIP. We're going to use another program to see, okay, so at what point in our long string 
is this little four characters right here. So we'll do pattern offset. So pattern create and pattern offset are your two tools. Dash Q means query. We're going to query for 6A41369. And we're going to do it with a length of 300 bytes because that's what we specified in pattern create. Okay, great. So we get some output and it says there's an exact match offset 268. So let's fix our skeleton exploit to do 268 A's. And then so remember, it said the offset is at 268. We want to overwrite EIP, and so once we reach that offset, we're going to add four Bs. Why four Bs? Because if everything else is an A, and we get four Bs in the EIP, which can fit four characters, we know that we've targeted it perfectly. And so you don't need to continue adding the rest of that length. Because remember what was said earlier. We want to overwrite EIP to crash the program. This will continue to overwrite EIP, if we did it correctly, of course. So now, let's run with our new skeleton. Let's take a look at EIP. We see 4.2, incrementally that's one up from the 4.1a, and we see B, 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 B. We've precisely located exactly where the EIP roams. So now that we have EIP control, we want to go back to that EAX and ESP from earlier. We want to know, okay, what can I do with all of that stuff? So there is so there's these points that let you move around and run code in the stack and these points are jump and call points and what they mean is if you set some hexadecimal string into an EAX and you do a jump EAX the EIP will say okay I have a jump EAX point we're gonna jump to the EIX position now EIX, EAX has all this code stored. Let's run each hexadecimal bit a byte one at a time until we execute the full instructions. And so if we can find a jump EAX point and instead of 200 A's put shell code in EAX, we can exploit the binary and get full control. Because right now 200 A's, even if we get a jump EAX point, isn't really going to do much for us. The program won't understand it. But we'll go one step at a time. So now we're going to find MSF Elf Scan. If you have an older version of Kali, it actually works fine if you just type it. I've noticed that on this latest version of Kali, you're going to have to do a locate on it. It's uh, located in slash user slash share slash framework now. Frankly, I don't know why they changed the location, but they did. So we'll do a jump EAX first. Uh, let's start with a jump ESP because ESP is most common. We'll do dash f dot slash test. Dash f means specify the file. So dash j means look for a call or jump points. Those are the points we talked about that you'd go to to execute code directly. And then after that, we're going to look for them in the test file. And so we ran it, and we got no output. That means there's no static jump ESP in here. So there may be a jump ESP somewhere, but that doesn't mean it's a jump ESP we can take advantage of. Because remember our ASLR, some of these points will be consistent, some of them will be randomized. And it's all based on what the program needs to have consistent to run perfectly every time. And so great, we found a call EAX point. And another way to visualize this is that nice great object dump. Dash D means disassemble, dash L means Intel syntax. And then we're going to grep call EAX. Well, let's grab EAX. It might be that there was a, yeah, so there was a few more spaces than one in there, so that's why our grep failed, but as you can see here, this point is the same as this point. So that call EAX is built into the assembly within the program. It's static, and that's why when we grep for it with object dump, we can actually see it. This is not going to be randomized on runtime. This is always going to be the same point, always. And so let's take advantage of that. So we have this jump EAX, uh, I'm sorry, this call EAX point. Let's add that into our exploit. I 
I always like to leave it there, comment it out in case you make any mistakes. It makes it easier to go back to. And so this is our EIP. Remember, we want to call EAX by using the EIP. So we're simply going to store this location right where our four Bs are. So slash X. Oh, it's important to know. I almost forgot to mention. So when this is all read in memory, it's actually read backwards. It's called little endian. And so what you put in should be backwards to match that in little endian. So we're going to take this string, this 080483E3, and we're going to put it in little endian so that when the program reads it in memory, it's in that same position again for the 080483E3. So because if you don't do little endian, it's going to be flipped when it runs in memory and the program's going to crash because it's not an actual position. It won't know what to do with it. Cool. So we have EIP control and we have 268 A's. Of those 268 A's, we know that 200 are going to EAX. It can confirm like this. And so let's run GDB again. You're always going to want to run in GDB because you want to see how the stack reacts. And so there we go. We still have 200 A's, but we don't see any B's in there. That's great. That means we nailed the position of where we want our A's to be. And so that means we have 200 bytes of space for shellcode. So whatever shellcode we create needs to be 200 bytes or smaller. And since we have a nice jumpy AX point, this makes everything perfect. Everything is now falling together just the way we need it to be. Our EIP jumps to the EAX, but of course, and here it is on the stack. Um, if we saw something like this in another scenario where we overflowed it, we had EIP control and then we saw these A's on the stack, this is a scenario where you can actually use a pop pop ret. You would pop this off the stack, you would pop this off the stack, and then you would return this into the EIP. And so since we're not doing that example again, but I'll show you how to find them. If you type in ROP gadget and GDB PETA, it shows you pop ret, pop three ret, etc. So pop three red is pop, 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 return to EIP, so on and so forth. So we have an exploit skeleton. We have room for our shell code. We have EIP control going to call EAX. So now we need some shell code. So I'm going to show you the easy way to do it first, and then we'll make our own shell code together next. Oh, sorry, MSF Venom is the proper one. So dash P is the payload flag. So let's specify a payload. Linux slash shell slash exec. This is just a payload that lets us execute a command. We can specify the command here. We'll do command equals slash bin slash sh. And then we'll give it some bad characters. Remember, that x00 null byte from before, we don't want that appearing in our shell code or it stops execution. And then dash f python. This just means gives us the shell code in a format where we can stick it in a python script. Oh, hold on. There we go. So I had to specify the platform for this payload. I'm not, I'm sorry, the, um, the operating system, which is a 32-bit operating system. So since this is a 32-bit binary, that's fine. We have 32-bit shellcode. If you're exploiting 64-bit binary, you're going to want 64-bit shellcode. And so it's important to match that. And so since this was formatted for Python with our dash F, we're just going to copy and paste that over. You can just stick it up top. Great. 
So then we're going to put our buffer at the beginning, because remember, the 200 first bytes are what get stored in that EI, uh, I'm sorry, in that EAX. And that EAX is what we want to jump to. So we're going to store the beginning of the shell code in the EAX, so we jump there and run the code. But then we notice that our buffer size is going to be much too big now. So if we go back here, we notice that MSF Venom gives us the payload size, 70 bytes. So what we're going to do is subtract 70 from this 200. So why would we do that? I'm sorry, 68 Bs, that's right. Uh, so the reason we did 200 A's and then 68 B's is if you go back up here, you'll notice that A only repeats 200 times in the EAX. And so what we did is we wanted to see, well, will any of these B's appear in the EAX? How much control, how much precision do we have? And we noticed that here what we ran was 68 B's with 200 A's. The B's got stored in EBP and elsewhere but all 200 of our A's got uh, stored perfectly in EAX. And so this clarifies for us, okay, we have 200 bytes space for any shellcode we decide to make to exploit this binary. And that's why it's important. Because even though it's 268 bytes to the EIP offset, this confirms we only have 200 bytes to work with in the EAX, and that those 68 Bs, there's nothing that can be done with those. Not with this, at least. And so we subtract from our A's the length of the shell code. And this is important because, as we said, it takes 268 bytes until we overwrite the EIP. So if we give it 269 bytes, we're going to have one of these B's get overwritten into the EIP. And again, that means nothing. We need this exact address. Precision is key. And so all this together, all of these links together are going to equal 268 exactly. Because once we reach that point, we again overwrite EIP with this call EAX, which will go all the way back to the beginning and run all the shell code in the buffer. And all of these are instructions. It'll run this instruction first, and then this instruction, and then this instruction incrementally. And the hexadecimal just converts in a way that the program knows what each means. And that's why you do shellcode in hex. You want to be able to do this any other way. It needs to be on this low level for the assembly language. So let's run this. And let's see if we get a shell now. So what's important to check is, of course, the security is in place. If we recall from before, there was DEP, ASLR, and all those others, but we're only going to focus on these two. We're going to want to see, well, is any of this enabled? So since we're storing this shellcode on the stack, if DEP is enabled, we will not be able to execute that shellcode from the stack. So all of this would have been moot. So before we run anything, Let's make sure DEP isn't enabled. Running check sec in GDBPDA shows that every single security is disabled. That's perfect. So this means that our new exploit should run and give us a shell. Great, and it looks like we were successful. As you can see by the new hash here, slash bin slash sh ran, our shell code was successful, and we've gained a shell. And so let's look at the practicality of this. Uh, let's create a new user, a test user. Okay, and then we're going to chown it to the test user. Now this is going to set UID it. And so if we look at it, it's set UID ran as test. If we do a who am I real quick, I'm the root user. And now let's run the exploit once again. Who am I? I am now the test user. So this is a set UID example of where you can do an account takeover using a buffer overflow. So now what happens if DEP is enabled? So if DEP is enabled, this code should no longer execute because the stack would be non-executable. 
So to take another look at the non-executable stack, we can do readelf-l dot slash test. If we look right here, it says GNU stack. And if you notice right down here, it says read, write, and executable. So that means the stack on this program is readable, writable, we can store shellcode to it, and executable, we can run the shellcode that we've stored. So now we have that second binary. Let's see what readelf shows on the second binary. All of a sudden, our executable is gone. So we can read from the stack, we can write to the stack, but if we do a jump EAX call and execute shellcode from the EAX, it'll no longer work because DEP has been enabled. If we want to confirm our suspicions, we can try running the exploit again on the second binary. And as we can see, we continue to get a segmentation fault. Because even though we have that control, that EIP control, and we can say jump to EAX, nothing in that EAX that we store is executable. And so the program will crash and nothing will run. So how are we going to bypass it in this scenario? So first what we're going to do is we're going to disable ASLR. I actually made a quick uh, alias for it. You guys are going to have to do it manually. And we can check if ASLR is enabled with an LDD. So as you can see the stack point right here, this is what's important. Three times in a row and it's exactly the same. What happens is ASLR is on. You notice three times in a row we have completely different stack points. So this is the libc library and ASLR is randomizing it. So we're going to turn ASLR off, we're going to confirm it's off, and then we're going to use red to libc to bypass step and again a shell on this next binary. So how are we going to do that? So we have our skeleton, and we have EIP control. So this buffer is no longer going to work. We're going to get rid of all of that. We're going to continue to have A's up to 268 bytes. And then we're going to get rid of these B's. So now we need something new to store in our EIP. Because if we can't do execute shellcode from EAX, calling EAX doesn't really help us. So Python skeleton.py should just give us 268 A's and 4 B's. We can run test2 with the exploit skeleton. Now we can confirm we have EIP control again. So what we can do from here is find a system call in libc. And how we do that is actually very easy. When you're in GDB, you type in p system. You see how it says libc system right here? That's how you know it's a libc call. And because ASLR is disabled, this point right here will be static. And so that's going to be what we store in our EIP now. We're going to be making a system call using the libc function. So again, I like to stick that in there as a comment. 308B E3 and B7. So 308B E3 B7 in little endian because it has to be backwards for the conversion. And so what is this going to do? It's just going to call the system. It's not really going to do anything useful for us yet. So we're going to have to couple this with two things. We're going to combine it with an exit call and a slash bin slash sh call. So we're going to say system call slash bin slash sh. When we're done running the shell, go to a graceful exit. And so this is important because the graceful exit shuts down any alarms. It makes it seem like the program didn't crash at all. There was no segmentation fault. You've exploited it and you've successfully exited it and nothing's getting alerted because nothing actually even crashed. Um, so I'll answer the question that just came in real quick. Um, basically, the only way to stop this is to sanitize the buffer. So it's, it's not about hard coding length. You, you, so you, 
if you're doing this properly, you're going to have to tell the code how much, what the length of bytes should be to be stored into that buffer. That's always going to be necessary. You're not going to get past that. But the way to solve this is string copy itself is actually insecure. And so I, I forgot the function names. I don't code in C as often as I should. But there's a certain um, function similar to string copy. I think it's string copy F or something. And what it does is it actually, when you say 256 bytes, it says 256 bytes, no more at all. And so in this way, you can actually secure your C code. It's simply using a vulnerable function versus using its um, non-vulnerable, uh, how would I say this? One is newer and the other is old and vulnerable. If one never gets deprecated, I'm not sure, but that's all it really is. You just need to find the proper string copy function or print function to securely output and store all this stuff. It, it's the same with malloc. Uh, in a heap overflow, there's malloc, and then there's uh, another mirror of malloc that actually sanitizes and checks, okay, is what we're storing in memory actually the amount that we're saying we should store? It's really that simple. It, it's like adding one letter to the function, and all of a sudden, you've got the secure version. So continuing on with this, well, we have our system call in libc. What we want to do next is find an exit call and a slash bin slash sh for the system to call. So these are going to be pretty easy too. Just like we did p system. Well, we're going to have to run the program first. Oh, and so actually, we'll leave it at this because you'll notice that what's interesting is it's trying to run this new program, file name too long, gives all sorts of errors. And that's because of our new system call. It's not giving us that seg fault anymore. It's making a system call, which is perfect. So we're going to have to return this to four Bs in order to continue the overflow and get what we need. So P system gave us system. P exit gives us an exit call. And then find slash bin slash sh will give us libc bin slash sh. So we're just going to copy all of this and comment it out. So we know this is the libc call because it says libc right here. We found multiple slash bin slash shs. The rest will come in later. And this is our exit call. So what we could do is we could do four A's and then just go straight to the slash bin slash sh. And why those four A's are required is because of how exec VE works. It's going to um, look for an argument and then it's going to look for the exit call right after it. And so we're simply saying, let's not provide anything for the exit call. We're saying we didn't find one or the exit call is moot, ignore it. We're going to put our system right back in here which when we wrote it down was 308B, E3, B7. And then we're going to put our bin slash sh there. Don't forget the little endian. OK, so this is going to run a system call from libc. It's going to go past the exit call with four A's, and then it's going to hit slash bin slash sh, where it'll execute and give us a new shell. So now let's see if this works. It looks like we were successful. And now just to make it a bit more satisfying. And that didn't quite work. There we go. Well, not to waste too much time, but if I had done this properly, yeah, there we go. Who am I test? And so we've successfully gotten the test user now. Sorry, slippery fingers today. So. What we did there is we used libc functions simply to call a shell. 
But what's important to note here is the moment we exit our shell, we continue to get a segmentation fault. Antiviruses and IDSs and those sorts of things are going to say, oh, this program is crashing, or our system monitor is going to say the service crashed, it's not running as it's supposed to be running. And that's why we found that exit call, because what happens if we have a valid exit call is it will no longer segmentation fault. It'll do a graceful exit, and it won't alert any systems about it at all. And so we can see what that looks like by changing these four A's to a graceful exit, whereas right now it's just seg faulting because it doesn't know where to go. So E0, C7, E2, B7. So it'll still give us a shell, but now when we exit, there's no more segmentation fault. And we can actually take a look. And so this will show you everything. It shows that we exit status zero and everything went as it should, you see. Whereas the crash would not have shown that. It would have continued to have seg faulted. You can even use trace to see the exec VE for the bash call. So you see here, exec VE slash bin slash sh. That's actually the system call we ended up making. And it's appearing in Strace. And that's what's great about Strace, because if you're trying to make a system call and you think you're putting slash bin slash sh, but it's not working, you can use Strace and you might notice, hey, I thought I was putting slash bin slash sh. Really, I'm putting slash bin slash, and that doesn't do anything. And so you can use Strace to track that output. It's a very, very useful program. Sure, so let's do a GDB-Q of it, and we'll set our breakpoint. So GDB-Q dot slash test two. We set a breakpoint at our system call, and then we're just going to run the exploit. Uh, well, GDB is always going to have those fun little problems, but instead of wasting time debugging, I'll explain. Basically, the system call is getting stored in the EIP register. So when we do a regular run with uh, Python dash C print a times 300, hold on. So when we do a regular run like this, uh, basically if this was our exploit, you'd see here that there would be a system call from libc, and this system call would call it exec VE, which we can see up here. And the rest of that you can think of getting uh, stored in the stack. So the bin slash sh and the system call we're making is all getting stored in the stack to be called by the EIP exec VE. It's going to say, okay, so uh, these next four points that are stored in the stack, what are they? All right, that's my exit call. I'm going to store that in the exec VE. And the four points after that appear to be my bin slash sh. I'm going to store that in the exec VE. And that's how we get this nice little exec VE right here in the first place. They're, so they're just getting added to the stack, remember, because everything after the EIP when we did our A's, you know, remember we had 300 A's, 268 get stored, uh, I'm sorry, 200 get stored in EAX, 68 get lost, 4 get stored in the EIP, and then because uh, 268 plus 4 is 72, we notice 28 A's get stored in the stack. So they're literally getting stored right here is the exit call, right here is the slash bin slash sh, exec VE call exit. That's how it's working. And so what happens if ASLR is on? So remember, libc is now going to be randomized again. Will our exploit continue to work? So let's do a run and see. And it turns out no. 
because of the randomized points, the points that we've given in the exploit are no longer valid. It's always going to be different. No, no, they're not stored in EAX because EAX was those first 200 days. So if we look at the skeleton, so all the first 200 of these get stored in EAX. Only the first 200, but this is where EAX gets stored. Everything after this is no longer in the EAX. This, everything after EIP in this program gets stored in the stack. And so we're saying EIP, do an exec VE system call using these points that are stored in the stack. And so it finds this point in the stack, this point in the stack. So based on how an exec VE works, it requires these arguments. I mean, you can run a system or exec VE call with no arguments, but it won't do anything. It just doesn't know what to do. And so once you make that exec VE, it's always going to be like this. When you make a system call, it's always going to be the system call, the exit call, and what to run after. This is just how you will always structure your exploit code for this sort of thing. And so we did this with libc. We're going to be doing it with a PLT as well and stored strings and it's going to be the same structure because it's based on how an exec VE in C runs. And an exec VE looks for arguments in this sort of order. So this is EIP. These are points in the stack that we're calling with our exec VE, and this is stored in EAX, EBP, and about 64 of these are lost. I mean, they go somewhere, but it's not, those 64 aren't anywhere where we need to mess with them. And so, of course, this doesn't work. So we talked earlier before about the PLT and GOT, and these are things that are always going to be static. And so we can take advantage of this. So if we looked at our test.c, we actually noticed that the C program itself is making a system call. If you ever see a C program making a system call, you can take advantage of that. This is going to be the same system call as the one libc executes. The only difference is this system call is built into the procedure linkage table of the program, whereas the libc system call was randomized in the libc library. And so because PLT is always static, it's easy to find. We can use our handy dandy object dump, dumping it in Intel syntax again, and we're going to grep for all at PLTs. So PLTs are normally built-in functions directly from the C program itself. So for our string copy, we see a string copy at PLT. For our printf, we see a printf at PLT, and we even see our system at PLT here, so on and so forth. So if there's a printf in the program, there will be a printf.plt you can take advantage of. And so what we want is our system at PLT. We want a whole new system call since the libc1 is now randomized. So let's take that and comment it here. Now you'll notice that this is actually pretty small. It's only seven numbers long. That's just because the zero is hidden. It's going to start with 080484E2. Remember our little endian. So we're gonna little endian this, 84, So that's our system call for the PLT. So there's actually no exit function in here, and there's no exit at PLT as a result, and libc has now been randomized. So unfortunately, this means we no longer have an exit call we can take advantage of. So unfortunately, we're going to have to get rid of this exit call, and we're going to be left with a program that's going to crash on exit, which is going to bring a lot of alerts, but that's all we can do. I mean, unless you wanted to use a memory leak or brute force the exit call, which would both bring a lot of attention in themselves. So if you look at this, this is the libc slash bin slash sh. Again, libc is, ran libc is randomized. That's not going to help us. But gdb can. So gdb dot slash test2. Uh, we're going to run it. And then we're going to do find slash bin slash sh. So you'll notice two slash bin slash sh's here that say they're from test two. That's actually because if we look back at test two again and we cat test.c, it actually has slash bin slash sh as a string in the program. So what's happening is at some point in this program, it's taking this string and statically assigning it to a position in memory so it knows exactly where to call it 
and we're able to take advantage of this slash bin slash sh from where it's stored. And it's stored in two different positions. We're just going to take this one. It doesn't matter which one, both should work. Okay, and don't forget your zero at the beginning. You're never gonna have one that starts with eight. If you see an eight zero four, that means there's a zero hidden at the beginning. And so we're gonna put that here as our slash bin slash sh directly from the C program. Remember, this is no longer libc. Okay. So moment of truth. Oh no, so we can use our strace to see what's going on. But first thing we're going to do is double check and it appears that I put in the incorrect system. So it's a good thing we did. So I'm sorry, this is actually where it gets called. This is the static position of the system at PLT. So you're gonna to wanna to do the 5083.0408. And there we go. Now we have successfully exploited this binary bypassing ASLR because we use the PLT system call and DEP because again, we used a system call that was built in. We didn't store anything on the stack to execute. We simply said take an existing system call that has a static address because it's built into the program and have it run the slash bin slash sh string that was stored in the printf. So we're literally calling the string using a system call and that's how we're getting this shell. Again, this all gets stored in the EIP and the stack and everything after that system call just gets stored in the proper positions of the system call if you look at the exec VE. Um, let me show you what that means. So all of these are arguments that are required and so this is the exec VE itself. This is the slash bin slash sh that we provided. Uh, if we didn't provide four A's, we would have had like an exit call somewhere in here and it all just gets thrown in there and that's how it works. It, it's really that simple. And so we have a little bit of time. I'm not sure how deep we can get into shell coding. Um, so what I think I'll do is I'll go over the basics and if you guys have any more questions, you can uh, go ahead and ask. I'll keep an eye out. We have nine more minutes. We might as well get into a little bit of shell coding. So this is actually a program I made myself called New ASM. It's on my GitHub, but um, we're just using it to speed things up a bit since we don't have much time. So what, all it does is it creates an ASM file. So an ASM file is an assembly file, and that's what you use to create shell code. So if we look at test.asm, well, so what is this doing? We see all those interesting instructions from our register that we saw when we ran GDBP. To, and let's get rid of this stuff because we're not actually going to add any additional arguments. So zor eax eax push eax move push move move and int. So what we're doing here is we're moving items around in the stack and then we're reaching a point where we're executing a system call. So let's go over this line by line real quick. So zor eax eax. Zor is a way of comparing two different bytes if they're the same, I'm sorry, two different bits. If both bits are the same, the final bit becomes a zero. If both bits are different, the final bit becomes a one. So if you zor something with itself, since it's all the same, we're literally zeroing out the register. We're saying nothing in the EAX. We want this to be emptied out for the beginning of our system call. So, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, OWASP is probably the best resource there is. Uh, I'll give you some links after this. So, Zor EAX, EAX emptying out that EAX register. We don't want anything in there. We want it to be clear for blast off. And then push EAX, where push means take the register you want to push and put what's in and onto the stack. So this zeroes out the stack. This zeroes out EAX. Uh, for safety measures, we're also going to clear out some of our other registers. We don't need EVX. Uh, we don't want ECX filled. And that's because EAX, EC, EBX, ECX, and EDX are all integral to how a system call runs. 
And so if they're filled with anything, when the system call executes, it's going to run with what's executed in them. Uh, I mean, there's there's many, many different kinds of system calls. ExecVE just happens to be one of the system calls that we're using for our shell code. And so uh, I can actually show you this real quick since we're doing shell coding anyways. This is a system call reference table for Linux. This shows 10 entries, but if you look further, you'll see that execve is number 11. And that's actually important because if you see here, we're doing move AL11. AL just means in the lower eight bits for EAX. AL is EAX, BL is EBX, CL is uh, ECX, so on and so forth. And the reason we're doing move AL instead of move EAX is because we only want to use eight bits. If we use the full register, we're going to have some zeros, which are null bytes. But that 11 into the EAX, that's actually what tells the shell code, hey, this is a system call. So in OX80 is the magical thing that it says, whatever is stored in those registers, execute it now. That's all the NOX80 does. It says, execute whatever system call has been prepared. And if you look here, if we move 11 into EAX, the system call that's being prepared is six, sys exec VE. And so let me put the system call table into the chat. And so if you look here, um, if we put uh, four, for example, we would be able to echo and output out to the screen. Um, and it even shows you here what you need to store in every register. So EAX for a sysexecve needs to be OXOB, which is the same as 11, 9, 10, 11. It even shows you the number here. And so an EAX needs to get this. EBX gets the care user pointer and so on and so forth. It can be a little overwhelming looking at this at first. Uh, you'll, you'll get used to it over time. Basically what's happening is we're giving EAX the system call itself and then we're going to store in EBX our actual slash bin slash sh. And so you see how it says add your payload here. This is where we would push a slash bin slash sh string and an example of that would be string hex slash bin slash. Again, this is a program I made up. And so why I did the slash slash there was, again, to avoid null bytes. I have to use the full buffer. Otherwise, we're going to have a zero zero in here because it's going to be uh, 30, 62 bits versus the 64 that we want. New.asm. Some, there we go. And so you can see here that pushes our payload. So zero out all the registers, zero out EAX, push slash bin slash sh onto the stack into ESP, move what's stored into ESP into EBX, since EBX has the actual call. Then we're going to push EAX, zero it out again. We're going to push EBX onto the stack, and then we're going to move what's on the stack into ECX. We're going to prepare our system call. Uh, ECX is really just arguments. If you want to do something else, I'm just putting an argument slash bin slash sh for the program slash bin slash sh. And then we're moving the system call 11, which is exec VE, into EAX, which tells the Linux program to run exec VE. So let's see here. So, so the key to ensuring there's no external bytes is managing accordingly. So, for example, this 11, that's not very many bytes. If you just do move EAX 11 and compile that, EAX is a 32-bit register. OXOB does not take 32 bits, so you're going to have a bunch of zeros to compensate for that. So that's actually why we do an AL, because we're saying, no, we don't want to use the full register, just use the lower bits. And this is one of the ways we say no zeros. Same with this. So if you actually decoded this, uh, the two Fs are slash. So this is slash bin slash slash sh. That's what this full thing is. So if we didn't do the slash slash sh, it would be uh, something like this probably. Slash bin slash sh. And it's going to have this null byte here. And it, and it wouldn't work because it would have to compensate for that empty space. So that's why we added that second slash. We're making up, we're saying we don't want any empty space, we'll just add a second slash and that's going to be the full eight bytes. And so that'll fill the register up twice. 
And so we can do nasm dash b32 test.asm. Uh, hold on. nasm dash f elf test.asm. There we go. LED test.o dash o test dot slash test. And as you can see, we've just created very, very basic shell code to get a uh, slash min slash sh shell. And so what we can do is, again, I have another program that hexes it for me. The shell code is 29 bytes long. Uh, we can try with my custom shell code, uh, shell equals, do a test, see if it works. Uh, it may or may not work depending on how uh, the registers are emptied out, of course. That's all very important. Um, we'd again do a EAX call here. It's 29 bytes long, so shell plus, and then this would be minus 29. And we'd have to do our call EAX back in here. E3 slash X, A3 slash X04 slash X08. And again, we'd have to run this on the first binary because the second one isn't vulnerable to an executable stack. And would you look at that? It actually works. We got a shell with our own custom shell code. And looks like test is no longer set UID just for one more run. Well, you get the point. <laughs> there you go. So we've successfully got in the shell with our own shell code as test user. It doesn't fill the remaining bits. That's why we use move AL. Because if we did move EAX 11, it would use the full 32-bit register. And since the 11 can't fill the register, we get a bunch of zeros. AL says, I don't want to fill the whole register. Let me just use what I need. And that's why the AL removes the null byte entirely, because you're only using the lower eight bits, and that 11 perfectly fills those lower eight bits. No more null bytes in that shell code at all. And you'll even see here it shows slash bin slash slash sh, because that's what our shell code had to execute in the end. If you want to see what else it looks like, So you can step through it. Uh, we'll do an object dump to get the beginning. Oh, you know what? It actually worked because we removed the binary. <laughs> but yeah, so we replaced the binary. But uh, assuming this wasn't dep enabled, we tried on this one. But the shellcode should work regardless. If we look at the object dump, uh, it actually shows us exactly what the instructions were that created it. All that good stuff. Yeah, uh, I'm recording the video. Uh, I'll let Tyro know to put it up somewhere for you guys so that you can all download it. And so before we leave, I'll just do a quick step through using GDB of the binary we created. So what we're going to want to do is first break at the main function so that we can step through every single point and see what's happening as we run through. So 0x, that's our breakpoint. It says start right here. That's how you know it's our breakpoint. We run. Once you run, it goes to the breakpoint and it stops. So just like the assembly we created, there's a Zor EAX EAX. It's even in the EIP. S means step, so we're stepping through. And so next is Zor EBX EBX, step through again, step through again. Then we push that EAX. And if we keep going, eventually we reach the system call. And once that's made, we've executed a new program and we've gained our shell. So we can actually Test that shell code here. One more run. Hmm. 
Must have emptied it out. One more. And there we go. So our custom shell code ended up working in the end. Any other questions? You can even see how LTrace runs. It's literally tracing output. It's great for reverse engineering. It shows us the printf. It shows us the string copy. It gives you everything. I'll be around for a few more minutes if you guys have any questions. Buffer overflows specifically, um, so I can give you guys a link. Uh, smash the tux. The the first one in smash the tux is actually really easy. It's oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. Let me get that link. So it's actually really easy. It's very similar to the buffer overflow we did today. Uh, if you go through Smash the Tux, eventually you're going to reach a point and it gets quite difficult. What's great about Smash the Tux is it actually has um, uh, PDF guides in case you don't know what you're doing. So, yeah, uh, yeah I'm completely self-taught. I mean, I've been doing this stuff for about a year and a half now. A um, long time ago, I found out about OSCP. I decided to try it four months later in September. I got certified. I got every single machine in the lab. And then from there, you know, things got pretty pretty nice. Once you get OSCP, a lot of doors opened up for you. Um, but really, I'm just totally self-taught. I went to school for advertising. I didn't study computers in high school or anything. I just really, really love this stuff. And Volnhub is actually a great resource in general. I can link that here as well. Uh, if you want an OSCP type lab, but you don't have money for the OSCP yet, uh, Hack the Box is great. I'll place that in too. Uh, books I'd recommend, uh, Art of Exploitation. This is the best book there is for binary exploitation, like period. Nothing will ever, ever beat this book. I'll leave a link here. No, no, no. So it, um, it reads the full EAX, but you have to remember, when we're using AL, we're not using the full EAX. That's why we're using the AL. So if we were using the full EAX and we put a bunch of numbers in there, it would use a totally different system call. It actually wouldn't know what to run. So what's nice about AL is if we did, so let me show you. It might actually be easier to visualize. So nano test.asm. So let's just do move EAX instead of the move AL. So we'll do... And so you see here where it says move EAX OXB. 
Those first two bits are taken again, as they should be, because 11 fills up those first two. But now we have all of these zeros. That's because we're saying use the whole register when we don't need the full register. So in comparison, this is what an AL looks like. So these are the lower eight bits, okay? This full register is 32 bits. We don't want to use 32 bits because that would cause problems with these null bytes. We want to use only eight bits. And so if we do the AL and we compile this one back up, you'll notice those null bytes have disappeared. That's because we are no longer using the full register. So the difference is we used the full register here when we didn't need to. Here we're saying use the lower eight bits, leave the rest of EAX totally empty, as in EAX doesn't even get filled up. Otherwise, when you do the int OX80, it knows to read every register. It says, okay, what's an EAX? EAX has 11, great, I'll run that, et cetera, so on and so forth. If EAX is full filled to the brim with, and there's no zeros, it won't know how to proceed because there's no system call like that. It would have to be a system call number like 2000. So unfortunately, I forgot to record the PowerPoint. I do have copies uh, we'll be sending out to you guys and that we will make available. I did record the uh, practical portion, so we'll have all that available for video download as well. I'll be around for four more minutes if there's any more questions. Um, I'm going to be honest, having a degree for cybersecurity is kind of moot. Um, cybersecurity is a little too new. Uh, most of the degree, I mean, there, there's great programs out there, don't get me wrong, but most of the programs are in their infancy still. You're not really going to find a cybersecurity program that's going to make you a well-rounded individual. Most of that stuff is just pure theory and compliance. Um, if you want to get into the field, just be passionate. Go after the OSCP. That's definitely going to help you. Anybody who has no OSCP is treated like an expert, like immediately. Uh, do Vulnhub machines, do walkthroughs. I mean, one of the ways I got my starts was I was doing walkthroughs on Vulnhub machines. I mean, I'm always doing walkthroughs and making scripts and trying to find CTFs to do. Um, that stuff is always going to help you out. Getting first place in a CTF, I got so many cards anytime I get first place in a CTF. Everybody wants to hire you, you know? Um, I, I just recommend being passionate. Look for zero days, mess around with Google Chrome, be respectful obviously, I'm not saying do anything you shouldn't, you should always be within legal bounds, but you know, do those CTFs, do some write-ups, do some bug bounty programs, just be passionate and keep going at it, because the difference between the guy who gets the job in this industry and the guy who doesn't is generally the guy who gets the job is way more passionate and knows what he's doing. That doesn't mean that people who don't know what they're doing don't get the jobs. They definitely get in too. But when you show that passion, it, it makes things way easier. I've had interviews where they ask me, uh, what's your favorite DEF CON talk? What's your favorite exploit? If those are questions you can answer, you're perfect for this field. And so like I said, uh, art of exploitation is perfect for learning binary uh, in assembly. Uh, let me see. There's also Slay. Uh, security tube, Linux expert, here we go. 
I'll paste that in. Uh, PETA just outputs what's stored in every register currently. So that's what's nice about PETA versus regular GDB. If you want to see that stuff in regular GDB, you have to type it out manually. Um, I can give you an example. Uh, nano slash dot GDB in it. This is actually how you enable and disable PETA. So GDB dot slash test. Um, if we do a run Python dash C print. That shouldn't have happened. There we go. And so it's failing. Oh, wrong program. There we go. So run Python C print a times 300. And so we get that seg fault, but it doesn't have any of that juicy stuff that GDB PETA gives us. That's why GDB PETA is nice. You'd have to do like x slash 10s EIP, and then you'd get EIP or ESP. So manually typing it out versus looking at it. And so that EAX that uh, GDB PETA shows us is just literally what's stored in EAX at that time. And we can see that 200 A's are stored. We know we're providing 268. So we know either the first 68 are getting ignored or the last 68 are getting ignored. And that's how you can find out how much space you have for your shell code. So it's a lot of just logic and induction and understanding how everything moves around and works. If you wanted to check ESP, though, that's a different story. We noticed that our last 28 A's were actually filling up ESP. We didn't have a jump ESP point in this example, but if we did, then yes, we would just write as many characters as possible and see at what point um, ESP no longer gets written. Uh, let me show you an example. So uh, GDB dash q dot slash test two so we'll print 1000 a's versus the 300 from before we notice that even though we supplied 1000 a's there's only 200 getting read so we can deduce that there's no point in doing more than 200 a's um, so we know that 28 so 272 is up to EIP, 28 of those after get overwritten. So we'll do B times 200. And so we can see here we have 200 Bs available. And so we've perfectly aligned ourselves to have 200 Bs in the ESP and have 200 As in the EAX. If we change this to 201, as you can see, it remains at 200. All right, guys, I'm going to call it. Uh, thanks for showing up. Um, you'll get the recordings and PowerPoint. And for anyone who didn't, I'll have a Tyrone test around the zip, too. Uh, I hope you enjoyed listening as much as I did presenting.